Welcome to Spine Clearance for Nurses. This is Michael McGonigal, author of the Trauma Professionals blog. I'd like to accomplish three things here. First, I want to discuss the process of cervical spine clearance, give you some details about how this is done. I want you to recognize the nursing implications of the actual clearance process and any activity restrictions that the patient may have. And then finally, I'll show you some of the different types of cervical collars and give you some information regarding specific nursing care issues. First, I'd like to start off with a what's wrong in this picture picture. Now, you'll notice that uh, somebody is snapping a nice picture of the pilots here while there's something coming straight at them, uh, probably leading to a mid-air collision. Now, obviously, this is photoshopped. Otherwise, how would this photo ever get off the aircraft? Well, first, let's talk a little bit about cervical spine clearance and the process itself. There are two parts to this process. We have to clear the bones to make sure that there are no fractures, and we have to make sure that the ligaments are cleared as well. And I've got a little diagram here that shows several of the sets of ligaments. The most important ones are the ones in the very front, the anterior longitudinal ligament, the one right behind inside the spinal column, that's the posterior longitudinal ligament, and then there's a set that move along the spinous processes, the bumps that you can feel along the back of the neck, and those are called the interspinous ligaments. Those are the big three that we worry about. In awake patients, there are two ways that we can clear the spine. The first is clinical clearance alone, and the alternative is radiographic clearance followed by clinical clearance. Remember, I said that we have to clear both the bones and the ligaments. Sometimes we can do that just with clinical clearance alone, but sometimes we need x-rays for the bones and the clinical exam for the ligaments. So there are certain things that you have to do if we're going to clear the spine clinically without any x-rays. The patient has to meet these three criteria. They have to be awake and alert, they can't be intoxicated, and they really can't have any distracting injuries. Now, the definition of distracting injury is kind of tough. If you look at the picture on the right side of this slide, you'll see a pretty painful looking tib fib fracture. Our understanding of what's a distracting injury is evolving. And we used to think that anything anywhere that might hurt may mask the pain that a person may have in their neck and may make our clinical exam unremarkable. What we're finding though is that fractures that involve the upper part of the torso, high rib fractures, clavicle fracture, scapula fracture, those are the kind of things that are more likely to, to interfere with the exam. The main thing that we're concerned with is can this patient feel pain and could they tell if they have some pain in their neck in addition to these other things. There are four components to this examination. And basically what I will do is tell a patient, we're going to try to clear your neck. I'm going to take the front part of your collar off, so be calm, be still, don't do a whole lot. And then I'm going to run my fingers up and down the back of the neck, and I want you to tell me if you have any pain or you experience any tenderness as I do this. And I'm looking for pain or tenderness right in the middle, over the bones. It's okay and it's almost normal to have some pain along the muscles on either side of the neck. With that said, then I'll continue. I'll have the patient try to flex their neck so that they touch their chin down to their chest. If there's no pain or tenderness, then I have them extend it. And basically I have them look up at the ceiling if they're sitting up, or if they're lying flat in bed, I have them try to look at the wall behind them. If they pass that part of it, I have them gently rotate their neck back and forth, full left, full right. And then finally, I put both hands on top of their head and compress downwards to see if that elicits any pain. If not, I remove all portions of the collar. Key part here is if they pass the exam, yes, the cervical spine is cleared, but work not documented is work not done. So make sure that whoever does the clearance leaves a very clear note so that everybody knows that the spine is cleared. And hopefully at the same time, they'll write the order to remove the cervical collar. <clears throat> now, if the patient does have some pain or tenderness, x-rays are going to be required. If a cervical CT scan has not been done, it needs to be done in adults. If it has already been done, then all they need in addition is a set of flexion and extension views. If the flexion and extension views are okay, if they meet our standards, then the spine is cleared. Even if the patient continues to have some pain or tenderness, 
it's good. If you look at the left side of this slide, you'll see normal flexion and extension views. Ideally, we'd like to see a difference of 30 degrees from straight up in both flexion and extension. And we look very closely at the alignment of the vertebral bodies. We look at the front and back of the vertebral bodies to make sure that they remain in alignment. If they do, and they have good flexion and extension, then we will remove the collar. If you look at the picture on the right, you'll see that there is some slippage, and that is um, on the front part as well as the back part of the vertebrae, you can see it's slipping over about three plus millimeters. That's bad. And so in a case like that, we put the collar back on and we call the spine surgeons because this is not cleared and that is direct evidence of a ligamentous injury. If there are difficult cases, there are two possibilities. And these are in people who we just can't clear it clinically. We can't clear it with the x-rays that we talked about. In those cases, there are two choices. We can send them to MRI scan. It's expensive. Some people can't tolerate it very well. Uh, and MRI scans are very good at showing water. That's what they do. Unfortunately, our ligaments are very dry, so they don't directly show up. But if they are injured, you will see edema around the ligaments, and that is detected on the MRI. So if that edema is noted by the radiologist, we presume that they have a ligamentous injury, and once again, the spine surgeons need to be notified. The alternative is that we can just wait. Keep the collar in place, let the patient come back in a week or two to an outpatient office, and we will retry the clinical clearance process again. And chances are we'll be able to get it off. However, in the few who the pain actually persists at that point, then they need to see the spine surgeon, and most likely they'll be told to keep the collar in place for two to three months to allow for healing of the ligaments. Now, cervical spine clearance and activity. You have to realize that cervical spine precautions, if we're worried about the neck, consist of a cervical collar. If we're worried about the lower portions of the spine, the thoracic and lumbar spine, then the way that we protect against that is log roll precautions. The two are not interrelated. So if you have a patient with a cervical fracture or suspicion of a cervical fracture, they'll have their collar on, but if the thoracic and lumbar spines are cleared, they can be up in bed, they can be ambulating, etc., because those patients will ultimately be sent home, most likely, in that collar and be walking around. So cervical collar in place does not automatically mean bed rest or log roll precautions. Only if they have thoracic or lumbar fractures or a suspicion of that. Occasionally, your spine surgeon may also say that they want them at bed rest because they have such an unstable fracture, they're going to take them to the operating room where they're going to put on a halo. Bad choice for a restaurant name, unfortunately. All right, let's talk a little bit about cervical collars. I have, I've got diagrams of five. On the left side here, we have the classic Miami J. This is what we use at our hospital. Uh, these are very nice, and they can be uh, used for long term. They have nice padding. They're very rigid, so there's minimal amount of rotation, flexion, and extension. Another brand is the Aspen Collar, very similar. Uh, it is less expensive but we have found that it's a bit less comfortable, so we don't use it for that reason. At the top, we have the classic Philadelphia collar. This is kind of a harder foam collar. It uh, doesn't limit rotation and flexion and extension as much. It's not padded, and so will cause skin problems uh, if it's kept in place for any period of time. At the top right, we have one of the typical medic collars. This is a stiff neck collar. There are others that are even simpler than this with less padding, and this just has hard foam padding. But these are not acceptable for long-term use at all. These should be only used during transport. Finally, this is the soft collar. And these uh, really, in my opinion, the only thing that they do is keep your neck warm. They do not limit neck motion at all. They just kind of remind you that maybe you shouldn't be moving it around as much. Uh, this is a, an image of um, how we do a lot of the TBI research that is done these days with the mouse model. Well, let's wind up. Important points about cervical collars. First of all, the key thing is to have the cervical spine cleared as soon as possible. These collars are not comfortable to wear. And a general rule is that very few patients should ever have to go to sleep in their collar.
call somebody that can come by and do the clearance process and get that off. Occasionally you will run into patients who are intoxicated uh, and so they just can't be cleared until the next day. If the collar does have to stay on, then replace any pre-hospital collar with a padded one such as Miami J or Aspen or other brand. And anyone can do this as long as the neck is stabilized. It can be done by nursing, it can be done by physician assistants. There is no specific uh, qualifications to do this other than you need one person to ensure that the neck doesn't move while the other person slides the pieces of the collar and fastens them. Daily or more frequently, make sure that the uh, skin condition is monitored under that collar because even ones that are well padded can, le uh, can lead to skin breakdown. Finally, when these patients are ready to go home, make sure that you do good patient teaching. Make sure that the spine surgeon's restrictions are understood. When does the collar have to be worn? Sometimes they can be taken off for showers. Sometimes they can be taken off while a person is lying flat in bed. In other cases, they need to be on 24 hours a day. What's the process of showering? How do you know how to take care of the pads? How do you wash them? Um, you need to have extra ones so that you can show the patient what to do with them. And probably most importantly, make sure that the patient or their family knows how to put it on or take it off.